Michael is a fantastic writer about music, I think, and I think many of us think. He writes for quite a few newspapers, the New York Times, the Catholic Herald, the Telegraph. He has two books, Introducing Wagner, which has a new edition for this bicentenary, uh, Opera and Operetta. He once attempted, I read, Michael, to explain the ring in 30 minutes on television. Is that yes, right? that is true. And did yes. you succeed? I managed to do it, yes. Good, good. <laughs> well, we won't do that this evening, but another evening. Um, let me just read you a couple of those nice new recent extracts from Michael's blog at the Telegraph. On the Two Moors Festival in Devon. Sounds a wonderful festival. It's like going to the Wigmore Hall with better views and cows. <laughs> the Brodsky Quartet playing Zemlinsky's second string quartet in this festival a week or so ago. The finest playing I've encountered in a long time, fiercely focused, blazing with integrity and brilliantly imagined. I wish I'd been there. There are two more to come from the Brodskys, and I'll tell you at the end. The Raymond Blanc Festival of Music at presumably Maison des Quatre. Saison. It certainly was. Right. Yes. He says, when Shakespeare floated the idea that music was the food of love, he obviously hadn't sat through as many concerts on an empty stomach as the average critic. <laughs> so it was a joy the other night to find myself at an event that fed you orally as well as hourly. <laughs> and uh, on Calixto Bieto's Fidelio, currently on the London uh, stage, we had self-harming, splashing with sulfuric acid, a peculiarly ineffectual self-strangulation, and a glimpse of Floriston's capacious underpants. <laughs> Weeks of starvation didn't seem to have reduced his girth. But otherwise, this was, for Vieto, distinctly tame. <laughs> How many uh, people have seen that Fidelio, actually? Oh. Was it tame? Mixed. Sorry? Was it tame? For him, yes, but that's... Right. Um, okay. <laughs> usually a bit... Michael, just a quick note, Michael, I really would allow you to speak. <laughs> God, he's going on forever. Um, Michael has a connection with Britain from childhood. I think I'm right in saying that he fell in love with the music of Britain when he was um, singing in the uh, Newham Choir, was it? Was it called the Newham? There was something called Newham Goes to Town. Newham Goes it to Town. It was local school kids. Right, OK. Anyway, he first heard, or played, I think, uh, Britain's setting the 150th Psalm. He longed to go to Aldborough, but in spite of having a great aunt Flo, who lived in Bury St Edmunds, he was always taken to Felixstowe and never to Aldborough. <laughs> but once his father took him there, and gave, he said, "You've got an hour." And Michael ran to the Red House and rang the bell, but BB was not in. He did meet Peter Pears in 1986 when he just started writing, and uh, interviewed him at Claridge's Hotel. Peter Pears had had a stroke and found speaking difficult, but was very courteous and helped Michael spool back the tape of the tape recorder when it rolled onto the floor. <laughs> he's a passionate Britonist, and he's read everything written about him. This evening, he's going to talk about Benjamin Britten, <coughs> Hampstead, and beyond. Michael White. Thank you. Between 1928 and 1938, Benjamin Britten kept a diary. And it tells you something about Britten, that although at the end of that period he was reaching 25 years of age, the diary that he kept always was a schoolboy's diary. You know, one of those let's diaries mm -hmm. that has items in it about sailor's knots and how to make a walkie-talkie out of paper cups and pieces of string. <laughs> it was always the diary that Britain kept, a schoolboy's diary. And it was an interesting paradox in Britain that although he was a genius, and for many of us, the greatest musician this country has ever produced in its entire history, and I'm quite happy to say that. I mean, I think Britain's stature holds its own very easily against the great names of English music, against Purcell, against Vaughan Williams, against Elgin. I think ultimately Britain is the greater genius of them all. But although he was this extraordinary genius, he clung to his childhood for as long as possible. And thereafter, he clung to childhood through other people. Um, one of the dodgy things about Britain that 
periodically comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. And certainly at the moment, because of course this is the Britain's centenary year, this is the Britain's centenary month. It was born on the 22nd of November, 1913. But one of the things that always comes up is that Britain was very much drawn to the world of adolescent boys in a way that these days would have had Esther Ranson banging on his door with the police and the Daily Mail and people with bricks ready to chuck <coughs> through his windows. So in that respect, we can only thank God that Britain died in 1976 because things were very different then. But to go back to his diary, there's an entry on the 2nd of January 1936, and the entry says, Auden comes here for a meal at 7.30. We talk of my new song cycle, probably on animals, that I may write. V, nice and interesting and pleasant evening. Now that's typical of the prosody that you find in Britain's diaries. He was not the world's greatest writer of words. Certainly wasn't a great diarist, but then he was only 22 when he wrote that. He was a musician, and at that point in his life, things for him were indeed nice and interesting and pleasant. And when he says, Auden comes here, where is here? Here is a flat off West End Green in West Hampstead. Um, it's beyond what we think of these days as Hampstead. It's why I call this title Hampstead and Beyond. Mm -hmm. But actually, for Britain, it was Hampstead. He referred to it all the time as Hampstead. He wrote it on his letters, Hampstead. Um, and this is something that we forget. Mm -hmm. And it's been very much forgotten, I think, in this centenary year. Where, for Britain, is almost always suffering. It's almost always Snape and Aldborough. Those are the places that we think of as being Britain country. And without doubt, Snape, Aldborough, East Suffolk, that really is Britain country. But for two and a half years, he lived here and around here in Hampstead. And they were critical years. Um, admittedly, it was at a time in his life before he made his name as an international player. That didn't happen until he wrote Peter Grimes, and that was in 1945. But Grimes didn't come out of nowhere. Um, the ground had to be prepared for this piece. And in those two and a half years, which were from November 1935 until March 1938, he was here in Hampstead. And this is where he learned his business as a composer. And he learned it with a vengeance. I should say up front that he was here reluctantly. He was born by the sea um, on the east coast of Suffolk and that was without any doubt where he belonged and it's where he ended up. But he had to study somewhere, he came to London, he came to the Royal College of Music and during that time that he was at the college he was living in the Cromwell Road in quite shabby digs. His family were his family had a bit of money, but they were slightly shabby, genteel, middle, middle class. His father was the town dentist in Lowestoft. Um, and back in Lowestoft, that was where his mother was. His mother was uh, um, a woman about town. She was uh, a, a devoted piano teacher, churchgoer, quite religious. They lived on the seafront <laughs> at Lowestoft. Britain had a mother fixation with a vengeance. You know, he was destined to grow up gay. There was no way about that. Um, and he realised, when he'd finished being a student at the Royal College of Music, he immediately packed his bags and went back to stay with his mother in Lowestoft, because that's where he felt comfortable. But he then almost immediately realised that this was no good. You do not make your name as a composer on the international world, living with your mother in Lowestoft. <laughs> <laughs> so he turned around and packed his bags again, and he came back to London. And he settled into Flat 2, West Cottage Road, <coughs> above something that was called the Carlton Garage, in a cul-de-sac off West End Green. Um, it was a place that he was sharing with his sister. His sister was working in the Finchley Road as a dressmaker 
there was a dressmaking shop called Elspeth Bide. I'm sure it's long, long gone. Um, but that was why he settled there, because his sister was around there and it was convenient. And he shared this flat above the garage with her. If you go to try and find flat 2 West Cottage Road now, you'll be a bit stumped because it's not clear exactly where it was. The road is still there, it's this little cul-de-sac just off West End Green. But there's clearly been redevelopment over the years. And you can, looking around the buildings, you can guess what, which building might once have been a garage. But it's certainly not a garage anymore, and it's all been redeveloped into flats. So I can't point at the building and say this was exactly the one. But it was in that little street, nonetheless, above this garage. And he said of the garage, it's the coldest flat in London. Built on top of nothing, nothing on either side. And it, it was clearly quite austere stock. He wrote back to his mother um, asking for her to send my thick socks from the wardrobe. It was that cold. Um, and it was certainly Spartan. But it was, it, although it was Spartan, Britain did surround himself with home comforts. And one of the home comforts he had was a woman to clean and cook. She came in three times a week. You know, these were the 1930s. If you were middle class, you had someone to clean and cook for you, even if you were a young 22-year-old from Lowestoft. And he could <laughs> afford the woman to come in three times to clean and cook. Because at the start of 1936, he was earning eight pounds per week, with the prospect of more. And that was twice the national average income. Eight pounds per week. With that money, he was able to buy a car. He bought an old third-hand Lagonda for five pounds. <laughs> and all this wasn't bad for somebody at the age of 22. How did he manage to have his Lagonda and the flat and the cleaning woman and so on and so forth? It was because he managed. I mean, everybody realised from the word go that Britain was exceptional. I and mean, when he was a student, everybody knew Britain was the star student at the college. And he almost <laughs> immediately got a contract with Boozing and Hawks. Um, it, it, well, he got two contracts. He was with, with Oxford University Press and with Boozing and Hawks. But Boozing and Hawks was the critical one. Uh, so he had a royalty agreement with them, and he had money coming in from writing film music, which was another reason for being here in London. It wasn't glamorous film music. It wasn't Hollywood feature films. It didn't have big stars in it. It was very utilitarian film music for something that <coughs> turned out to be historically very significant and adventitious, called the GPO Film <coughs> Unit. They had offices in Soho Square, and they had studios down in Blackheath. And these were days when the GPO was a mighty organisation in a way that the post office, poor old battered post office, is not anymore. And it's interesting that there was such a thing as the GPO film unit. He started there in 1935, and it was the perfect, in, in May 1935, and it was the perfect job for him because it gave him everything he needed to become what he became. They made these films on a very tight budget. They were short films. Usually, the production turnaround for these films was five days. So, you, know, you can imagine what, what stresses and strains people were under. But they were little films. They normally only lasted five or six minutes at a time. And they, they had to be made with <coughs> very strict constraints of time and budget, economy. There had to be incredible resourcefulness on the part of everybody who fed into the process. Um, there had to be very clever special effects that were done on a shoestring. Everything had to be done with extreme practicality and professionalism. And the one thing above all that was required of the musicians who wrote the music was that you had to be able to create a very immediate impact with the sound that you produced. Because after all, you only had five minutes. So you had to look at the image 
attach the right sounds to the image and just make the, the impact right like that because you couldn't mess around, you couldn't develop ideas. It had to be very instantaneous and very sharp and very impactful. All this carried through to Britain as a mature composer particularly as a mature opera composer. He learnt so many tricks of the trade from writing the music for these little films. He also made incredible contacts with some extraordinary talents because working for the GPO film unit at that time were people like William Coldstream, the painter, Cav Cavalcanti, the film director, Montague Slater, the writer, W.H. Auden, the poet. It really was a collection of, of the cream of the cream of the mid-1930s artistic world in London. To fill you in a bit more about the GPO Film Unit, it was a new organisation. It was born out of a very 1930s sensibility. They gathered together in the GPO this multidisciplinary pool of painters and poets and musicians and filmmakers, all working on these films. And the projects that they made were partly advertisements for the post office, which, as I said, was then a powerful organisation. But they were partly films that had nothing to do with the post office at all, that were designed for some kind of broader public educational purpose. Um, in effect, the GPO Film Unit was the foundation for the whole tradition and industry of documentary filmmaking in this country. It was set up by somebody called John Grierson. And Grierson's background was making very gritty films about the working classes at work. You know, it was about showing you life in England with its sleeves rolled up and the dirt and the raw. Um, and Grierson says something very interesting about his mission at the GPO Film Unit. He said, I took on cinema as a pulpit and I use it as a propagandist. In the 1930s, the word propaganda didn't have the pejorative sense that it had now. You could stand up proudly and say, I am a propagandist. John Grierson was a propagandist. What this meant for Britain was that he was working on a very odd range of different kinds of films. At the one end, the films that he was working on were very innocent and rather charming. There's, th there's one film that I like very much. It was a cartoon film that was made with sort of cu cut-out silhouettes that moved. Um, and it was called The Torture. And The Torture is a film about the virtues of the post office savings bank. <laughs> and it's a fairy tale. It tells you the story of a young man who loves a young woman but he has no chance of winning her over until he reveals to her father that he has a post office savings bank and then everything changes and they're married and they live happily ever after. Um, the, the music that Britain wrote for this little cartoon film, um, and if you ever go to Albury, there's, there's a brand new Britain museum that's only recently opened on the side of Britain's house, the Red House, and it's a lovely little museum and they have this film playing on a, on a loop tape. Um, the music that Britain wrote for it is a very frothy reworking of Rossini. They're, they're, they're all second-hand tunes that he borrowed. It's all very uncharacteristic of Britain. It's not at all like the music that he wrote when he was writing his own stuff. Um, but nonetheless, it was very successful the way he adapted these Rossini tunes, and they eventually were reworked into a, into a concert piece. So that was, that was one end of the spectrum of these films he's working on while he's in Hampstead. At the other end of the spectrum, he was doing the gritty stuff for, for Grierson, um, making films with titles like Coalface, which is about miners, um, Negroes, which is about Negroes, <laughs> um, and the most famous one of all, which was Nightmare. Nightmare was a film about the journey that a letter takes when it's posted and it goes on the train up north overnight. On the, on the GPO train. That little film is a classic of its kind. It gets shown again and again and again and again. Um, it was done in very makeshift terms. Most of the music that Britain wrote for that is percussion effects. 
um, and train sounds and quite clever things like recording, um, he recorded some, some percussion noises uh, and then he reversed the recording, which you could do even back in the 1930s. So it sounded like a train coming out of the tunnel. The, you know, the, the, the sound was heard in reverse. All these quite clever but, 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 but makeshift things that went into the film. <laughs> um, and what, if nothing else, the Nightmare film demonstrates is that Britton Hagg, what, what his friend and, and, um, and biographer Donald Mitchell described as a photographic ear. And he was able to translate these images into sound in a most extraordinary way. But, of course, what <coughs> Nightmare is famous for is the fact that it, it puts together Britain's score with the words of W.H. Auden and that very famous poem, The Nightmare, which, at least the first section of it, imitates in rhythm the clackety-clack of the, the, the wheels of the train going over the sleepers. This is the nightmare crossing the border, taking the cheque and the postal order, letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner, the girl next door. And it just <laughs> goes through this long litany of all the things that are being carried on this train. Um, it finishes up with something like um, the, the clever, the stupid, the short and the long, um, the typed and the printed, and the spelt all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a wonderful, wonderful organ text. To go back to that diary entry I, I mentioned before, January 1936, 2nd of January, that is exactly when he's working with Orton on these films. Um, and that's the day that ended with a dinner with Orton in the flat above the garage in West End Green. And it was a typical day for Britain at that time. The diary tells us everything that happens. In the morning, he goes from West Hampstead to Soho Square to work on the first corrections of the film with W.H. Auden and Basil Wright, who's the director. For lunch, he meets up with his brother Robert and his sister Beth at the Lion's Corner House in Marble Arch. In the afternoon, he drives down to Blackheath to the studios of the GPO Film Unit for the second round of corrections on the film. Then in the evening, he drives back to West Hampstead and he has his dinner with Auden. These were very full days in Britain's life and they were not disagreeable ones. You know, it was a great thing to be working for the GPO Film Unit at that time. Um, that Auden features so much in Britain's life at this point is very significant. They were very close at this time as human beings. Auden was older than Britain. Auden around this time is 27, 28. Britain is 21, 22. And Auden is a very assertive figure. He was somebody who took charge of other people's lives. In other words, he was bossy. Um, and it was a characteristic that became insufferable as he got older. I mean, I think, I think as an old man, Auden must have been a totally difficult and disagreeable and spiky person to have to spend long periods of time with. As a young man, you know, you make allowances for young people who are bossy, um, and people did. The thing about Auden, of course, as well, is that he had a formidable intellect. And Britain was initially rather scared of Auden. You know, um, Auden made Britain feel that he was stupid. He had, after all, come from this very provincial, sheltered background in Lowestoft. Britain wasn't a great intellect. He was a musician. He wasn't that well read, at least at this point in his life. He didn't know very much about anything except music. The other thing about Auden was that he was a bohemian. He was dirty, he was messy, he had nicotine-stained fingers, he had appallingly bad table manners. <laughs> um, for Britain, from his sheltered background in Lowestoft, you know, middle, middle class, um, all this was at the same time both off-putting and exciting. <laughs> and it made Auden a very key figure in Britain's life. Britain was overawed by Auden, and in many ways, Britain surrendered to Auden. And the big question is, how much did Britain <laughs> surrender to Auden? <coughs> Auden was in love with Britain. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Auden was in love with Britain. 
Britain at this time knew that he was gay, but he was very, very <coughs> uptight about it, very pinched about his sexuality. And to the extent that he had any sexuality at all, it was di directed toward hopeless romantic friendships with teenagers, which went on in his life. Um, one can fairly assume that in number two West Green Cottages, at West End, off West End Lane, Alden will at one point have been chasing Britain around the kitchen table. And it's also fair to assume that Britain would have been raising his hands in protest and saying, no, Wiston, no, keep away. <laughs> um, and because of that, Alden took it upon himself to bring Britain out. He wrote Britain letters telling him to grow up and forget his interest in these skinny juveniles and find himself a real man, i.e. W.H. Alden. Um, the letters from Britain to Alden tell Britain to live more robustly or he'll never be a real artist. You know, Britain, Alden writes to Britain and says, you know, you want to live this cosy life with your family and everybody loving you. That's no good, Benji. You've got to go out and face, and the words he used were face the demands of disorder. And Britain was quite horrified at the idea of disorder. He, that was the last thing he wanted in his life. He wanted a comfortable bourgeois existence. Um, Alden even made public these exhortations to Britain to grow up and find himself a real man and stop being so middle, middle class and so pinched. Um, Alden went to Iceland in 1937 with Louis McNeese. And when he came back, he published a book called Letters from Iceland. The dedication printed up front in that book reads, For my friend Benjamin Britten, composer, I beg that fortune send him soon a passionate affair. <laughs> a really strange thing to print as the, you know, as the dedication to a book of letters from Iceland. I, I, what, what, what motivated Auden to do that? It's hard to understand, but there it is. And of course, Auden also wrote poems for Britain to set that seem to be addressed to Britain about Britain sorting out his sex life and his, and his every other aspect of life. Um, very often with Auden's poems to, that, 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 that he, he gave to Britain, it's hard to know to what extent they're autobiographical, to what extent they're really addressing Britain, to what extent they're really coming from Auden in a real first-person sense. But very often they really do seem to be direct messages to Britain. I mean, there's, there's one that always strikes me called Night Covers Up the Rigid Land. Um, this is a poem that, that Auden gave to Britain. Um, Britain did set it, but he never published it. Maybe because he thought that it was a bit too personal. Um, and it didn't get a first performance until 1985. In fact, Piers and I were talking just earlier about Graham Johnson, the accompanist. Graham Johnson gave the first performance of this long after Britain had died. And the words of night covered up the rigid land are this. Night covers up the rigid land and oceans quaking more and shadows with a tolerant hand the ugly and the poor. The wounded pride for which I weep you cannot staunch, nor I control the moments of your sleep, nor hear the name you cry. Whose life is lucky in your eyes and precious is the head, that's right, and precious is the bed as to his utter fancy lies the dark, caressive head. For each love to its aim is true, and all kinds seek their own. You love your life, and I love you, so I must lie alone. O oh, hurry to the fated spot of your deliberate fall, for now my dream of you cannot refer to you at all. That's almost certainly Auden speaking in his own voice of himself in love with Britain and Britain refusing his affection. And Auden is saying, OK, you're not going to have me, then somebody else is going to have your caressive head, but hurry to the spot of your deliberate fall. You know, go and find this person. Hurry. All this happening in 
West End Green. <laughs> um, in January 1937, W.H. Auden goes off to Spain. <coughs> Spanish Civil War. He meets Britain at the Lion's Corner House, which was obviously one of Britain's regular hangouts. Um, and they have lunch, and Auden hands over to him two poems. In fact, he writes them. Britain is carrying with him two of his own newly published scores. Auden opens them up and he writes <coughs> two poems for Britain. One of them is Farewell to the Drawing Room's Civilised Cry, and the other one is the famous lullaby, Lay Your Sleeping Head, My Love, Human on My Faithless Arm, which I suppose, apart from some of the Shakespeare sonnets, is one of the most celebrated gay love poems there has ever been written. Um, Benjamin Britten never did lie in Auden's arms, so far as we know. Um, so, in a way, this poem is not specifically about Britain. But why did Auden give this poem to Britain as his parting gift before he goes off to Spain, maybe to get his head shot off in the Civil War? Clearly, it's wishful thinking. Um, and again, when Britain received this poem from Auden, um, he must have thought this was a bit near the mark. And he never said, lay your sleeping head, my love, human on my faithless arm. Instead, and this was a mark of the way Britain could be quite cruel and detached in some ways, this wonderful poem that Auden has given him, he doesn't set it, he gives it to Lennox Barclay and says, <laughs> Lennox, do you want to set this poem? <laughs> and Lennox Barclay set it instead. I mean, unfortunately, not very well. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a distinguished setting. I mean, it's, it's one of the great missed opportunities that that setting did not get um, music by Benjamin Britten. The ordinary relationship with Britain is very important in many respects. Because if nothing else, as a wordsmith, Auden had incredible technical virtuosity. So knocking around with Auden and collaborating with him on things was an invitation to Britain to raise his game, to, to have in music the technical virtuosity that Auden had in words. And something else that Auden gave Britain at that time was a, a sort of ventriloquism. You know, Auden was somebody who could write in many different voices and be many different personalities in his verse. And Britain became exactly the same thing in music. He could, he could assume, like a ventriloquist, other sounds, other voices. Um, so what, what were the collaborations with Auden? Apart from the GPO film unit, there were endless settings of Auden songs, including... Britain's very first song cycle, Our Hunting Fathers, which is an anthology about the relationship between man and with animals. And we know from Britain's diaries that while he was plotting the music for Our Hunting Fathers, he used to go on long walks on Hampstead Heath. Um, there are references to him walking on the heath and seeing a rat. And it just so happened at that time he was setting this text that's in Our Hunting Fathers, Rats Away. Um, so he's figuring out all these things on his walks on Hampstead Heath. At the next collaboration with Auden was the second song cycle, On This Island. Um, he also worked with Auden on his very first opera, which is really an operetta, called Paul Bunyan. It was done in America. Then there are occasional pieces. Uh, the Ballad of Heroes, the hymn to St Cecilia. There was very nearly an oratorio with W.H. Auden called For the Time Being. And the fact that Britain took the words for this oratorio from Auden and then put them in a drawer and forgot about them was undoubtedly one reason why Britain's friendship with Auden fell apart. Um, they became estranged in midlife. And it bothered both of them hugely, and it bothered Britain enormously that he was no longer friends with Auden. Um, but, you know, when friendships die, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. And neither of the two were able to, to, to become friends again. Um, I'm sure that some of you will have seen that Alan Bennett play, The Habit of Art. Um, and that is about an imaginary meeting 
between Britain and Auden later in their lives, where they come together and say, you know, why did we fall out? But the thing is that it's an imaginary meeting. They never did come together again. That was it. Um, back in the 1930s, though, when they were friends, Auden opened lots of doors for Britain. Um, one of the doors that opened was a place called the Group Theatre. Um, it was a sort of British 1930s response to what was going on in German Expressionist theatre at the hands of people like Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. The Group Theatre was a collective of radical, leftist, highly political, largely gay um, writers um, like Auden, Christopher Isherwood, Louis McNeese, Stephen Spender, Rupert Doon, Robert Medley, John Piper, the artist, was involved. Montague Slater was involved. The music director, interestingly, at that time, was a guy called Herbert Murrell, who worked for the BBC and wrote church music. There are, there are settings of canticles by, by Herbert Murrell. But Britain took over Murrell's job as music director of the group theatre. And it was in this capacity that he was writing the music for plays by Auden and Christopher Isherwood. Plays like The Ascent of the F6, which has that very famous text in it, Stop All the Clocks. And Britain said that um, as a choral work. It was designed to be sung by collective voices in the play, The Ascent of the F6. And there were other spin-offs that came out of the Auden relationship and the group theatre. Um, as I said, all these people were very politically engaged. They were all to the left. Um, Britain, politically, was quite childlike in his views. He wasn't a sophisticated political thinker. But he was a committed pacifist and remained so for the whole of his life. So what he was writing at this time was music for an organisation called the Peace Pledge Union, which had huge rallies. And he wrote them march songs to march to, and you know, big, big ballads to sing collectively. Um, he was also collaborating on these, these kind of left-wing projects with, as I mentioned, Montague Slater, who became very significant to Britain because Montague Slater then wrote the libretto for Peter Grimes. Um, another of his collaborators on all these political projects was a man called Ronald Duncan. And Ronald Duncan became the librettist for The Rape of Lucretia. So these were all very critical contacts that Britain was making like crazy on all sides. Amid all this, in October 1936, he moves. He packs up from the very cold flat in West End Green, and he moves to number 559 Finchley Road with his sister, Beth, again. Um, 559 is at the sort of toward the top end of the Finchley Road. It's near where, where Platts Lane comes out. And if you go there now, and I did check it out only the other week, um, there's not very much to see. There's no plaque or anything. There's a very ordinary front door. Um, that's crammed next to a, and what is now the ground floor of that building. It's a, it's a Persian restaurant. And all the floors above are taken over by um, a language school, which is, seems to own most of the terrace now. And it's a bit crummy around there these days. You know, it's very noisy, buses going up and down. It's not a nice bit of Finchley Road at all. But one assumes that in 1936 it was much more genteel than that. So 559 Finchley Road is where he moves in October 1936 with his sister. And although now there's not much to see there, this was a momentous address for Britain. You cannot underestimate how important 559 Finchley Road was, for purely personal reasons, if nothing else. In January 1937, his sister Beth gets the flu. At that time, Flu was a dangerous thing to get. A lot of people died from the flu. She had the flu quite badly, so his mother in Lowestoft packed her bags, came to Finchley Road, moved in to nurse his sister. His mother then gets the flu. It turns into pneumonia. They call the doctor from Platts Lane, 
And on the 31st of January, his mother dies in the Finchley Road. Um, Britain is 23. He has now lost both of his parents, because his father had died before. As I'd said to you, he was utterly devoted to his mother. Um, and this was the most devastating thing for him. He felt that he'd been cast adrift. No parents anymore. And Alden, who'd become this very influential, older big brother figure, had just left from Spain, left to go off to Spain. So Britain had no Alden, no parents, and he's totally, totally devastated. What does he do? He throws himself into work. And it's very noticeable that in those months after the early 1930, early 1937, he produces an enormous amount of work, big stuff, like the Frank Bridge Variations, which of course is one of his most famous pieces. Frank Bridge Variations, written at 559 Finchley Road. Um, he also threw himself into something potentially very dangerous. Um, I mentioned that he had this romantic attachment to boys, and they were young boys. And these days, of course, Britain would get lynched for this relationship. But the mid-1930s were very different. And the fact was that as a gay man in the 1930s, he could have been sent to prison merely for being a homosexual, for having a relationship with somebody in the privacy of his own home. So in a sense, having a relationship with a boy, it couldn't get any worse. Britain's relationship with these boys was actually quite innocent. Um, I'm not a, an apologist for Britain's sex life. It wasn't a good idea for him to have these relationships. You know, relationships between adults and, and children are not good. Britain knew it was not a good idea. I mean, the paradox of Britain is that he was somebody, he was somebody who came, as I said, from this very bourgeois, middle middle class background. He was, Britain was proper in every sense. He, it's why he couldn't cope with Auden's bohemianism. Britain was proper, he was prim, he was a bit prissy. He knew the relationships with the boys was not a good idea. He struggled with it. And he was not predatory in any way. He was not a Jimmy Savile figure. He never forced himself on these boys. Quite the opposite. I mean, there were many documented cases of the mothers of adolescent boys forcing their sons on Britain because they thought, oh, my, my, my little Johnny, you know, he's a very talented young musician, you know, you should... And they wanted Britain to take an interest in their sons. They, they, they literally forced <coughs> their kids at Britain. Um, and his relationship with the boys was not particularly sexual. Um, the thing was that Britain was like a boy himself. What he wanted to do with these boys was to have adventures and larks and a jolly spiffing time. <laughs> and there really is no evidence of any of these boys suffering any harm from their relationship with Britain. Many of the boys, and since, I mean, long after all this happened, went on the record um, saying what happened between them and Britain. And they all kind of say it was wonderful. He was fantastic to us. We, 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 we loved the fact that Britain was interested in us. And what was traumatic for them was not having the relationship with Britain. What was traumatic for them was when it ended. Because the thing was, Britain liked adolescent boys, and adolescent boys grow up into adults. And when they got older, he lost interest in them. That was one of the cruel, cold sides of Britain. So, you know, it was a very difficult thing that was going on between Britain and these boys. One thing you can undeniably say about it, though, was that artistically it was very productive. The tensions that Britain felt within himself went into his works. There are so many Britain works about the vulnerability and innocence of children under threat. You know, all these pieces, like Turn of the Screw, I and mean, even going back, starting with Peter Grimes. What's Peter Grimes about? An adult man who has inappropriate relationships with, with his apprentices and ends up killing them 
accidentally or otherwise. You know, the, this thing about adults and children and their vulnerability, it comes up in Britain again and again and again. And of course, he writes loads of pieces that are designed to be sung by boys. <coughs> all, those, all those works come out of this, this tension within Britain about his relationship with children. There is only one instance that we know of where the relationship with the boy got out of hand. And that happened here in Hampstead. It was a boy called Harry Morris, and he was a chorister in Hampstead Parish Church. Um, there's nothing in the Britain Diaries to say that he was a regular attendant at Hampstead Parish Church, but presumably he did come, because somehow he got to know this boy in the choir in Hampstead Parish Church. He was infatuated with the boy. He took him for a weekend to Suffolk. Something went wrong. Presumably it got a bit heavy. The boy took fright and, and he had to be brought back very quickly to Hampstead and handed back to his mother. And this was a very, very dangerous occurrence for Britain. Um, it blew over. I don't imagine that he ever darkened the doors of Hampstead Parish Church again after that. Thankfully, Britain had other distractions at this time. Um, one of them was Peter Piers. While Britain was living in the Finchley Road, he met Peter Piers, great singer who became his life partner, who became his artistic collaborator, and of course the relationship between Britain and Piers is just one of the most extraordinary things that have ever happened <coughs> in the musical history of this country. I mean, you cannot underestimate the significance of Britain and Piers. It was a slow burn relationship. Um, we can't be sure when they first met exactly, because Piers was a singer, and he was beginning to have a career of mod moderate significance at this time. <laughs> Um, they moved in, into locking circles in London. So, you know, they, were, they were sort of, they must have been in the same room at the same place or in a studio at the BBC many <laughs> times before they actually took notice of each other. Um, but the, the catalyst for them to really get to know each other was a mutual friend called Peter Burrow. Um, Peter, that's two words, Peter Burrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Peter Burrow was a young writer, he was a poet, he was also a music critic, and he died young in an accident in April 1937. Um, because he was known to both Britain and Piers, they, together with someone else, ended up going down to Peter Burrow's house which was out in the country somewhere, after he died, to sort all his things out. Um, and it was a very <coughs> motivated sorting out. What they were really doing was destroying the incriminating evidence. Because Peter Burrow was gay. And again, you know, you didn't leave these sort of things lying around. So they went around to, to destroy everything they could find that, that was surviving evidence of the fact that Burrow was gay and the gay people that he knew. Um, in the process of doing all that, Britain and Piers really get to know each other well. Britain starts writing for Peter Piers's voice. Initially, pieces for the BBC. Britain wrote um, these, these sort of epic, it's hard to describe what they were really. They were, they were, they were like, um, um, they were like oratorios, but for the radio, and they involved readings and music, and, and, and they had quite long durations. One of them was called The Company of Heaven. That, that had a role in it for Peter Piers. Um, he also wrote music for a, a big radio production of, 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 King, of Purcell's King Arthur. That involved Peter Piers. Um, and I say he wrote music for Purcell, he was, he was, he was rearranging and reordering the music. Um, so they, they get close. And in October 1937, we know from Britain's diary that Peter Pierce comes to 559 Finchley Road and stays for a week. Now, we don't exactly know what went on during that week. What we do know was that he wasn't putting Peter Pierce up because he needed somewhere to stay in London, because Peter Pierce already had a flat in London. He, he had a flat which he shared with other people in Hallam Street by the BBC. So he didn't need somewhere to stay. 
He stays in 559 Fincher Road for a week. Um, what we do know is that it seems that they didn't commit to each other as a relationship after that week. Because we know that at some later stage, Peter Piers is, is running after a stagehand at Sadler's Wells. <laughs> um, and what we also know is that in some respects, their relationship didn't really get going until um, a year and a bit later when they go off to America together. Um, and we know that because there is a, there's a quite famous letter that Peter Piers wrote to Britain much later in their joint lives, where Piers is looking back on their relationship. And it's a letter that's quoted in all the books, you may have read it. It's, it's written in wonderful purple prose. And you know, it either makes you want to vomit or say, ah, isn't that touching? <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's a letter where Peter Piers says to Britain, you know, I don't know what I deserve to have had someone like you in my life. You are, you are, you are such a, a you, you are, I don't know, I can't remember what he's saying. You, you, are, you are such a fantastic artist and such a fantastic man. And I will always remember the night you first gave yourself to me in Grand Rapids. <laughs> <laughs> so, according to that letter, Britain first gave himself to Peter Piers in Grand Rapids. Um, but anyway, the fact remains that they first spend the night together in some shape or form under the same roof in 559 Finchley Road. Something else happens um, in 1937 in the Finchley Road. Britain writes this wonderful song cycle called On This Island, with words by W. H. Auden. It is one of the great modern English song cycles. Um, I was listening to it only this lunchtime. There was, a, there was a lunchtime concert down in the Royal Opera House. Somebody was singing the songs from On This Island. Um, the first public performance of On This Island took place in November 1937, and it was done by a soprano called Sophie, v Sophie Wies. But the first private performance of On This Island took place on the 15th of October in 559 Finchley Road, in front of a very interesting audience of people. Lennox Barclay had come round, Christopher Isherwood had come round, they had supper, and after supper, Peter Piers sang this first ever performance of On This Island. According to Britain's diary entry, he says, Peter sings them well. If he studies, he will be a V good singer. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes on to say, he is certainly one of the nicest people I know, but frightfully reticent. <laughs> um, this was one of the last things that happened to Britain in the Finchley Road because he moves out <coughs> on October the 20th, uh, writing in his diary, a nice house, but all those memories are too bitter. Of course, the memories are the memories of his mother dying. Um, it says, scarcely bearable, is how he describes it. And he moves from the Finchley Road to 38 Upper Park Road, Bill Sized Park. Um, He's only renting again. I mean, you know, people did rent in those days. They tended not to own the places they lived in. Um, he was renting a bit of a house that was being lived in by another composer, a very interesting, although minor figure, called Brian Easdale. Now, hardly anybody remembers Brian Easdale these days, but he was the music director of something called the Mercury Theatre, another of these little theatre companies. <laughs> and he, his chief claim to fame is that he wrote film music. He was involved with Powell and, Powell and Pressburger, big movie moguls at that time. And it was with them that he wrote the music to films like The Red Shoes. The Red Shoes, of course, was an incredibly famous film. I mean, one of the great dance movies of all time. He wrote the score. Um, he got an Academy Award for the score. He got an Oscar for the, the music to the Red Shoes. Um, later, he wrote some other very interesting things that have been totally forgotten. He wrote for the English Opera Group, which was Benjamin Britten's own opera company that he set up. He wrote an opera called The Sleeping Children, 
which I, I'm very interested in because the star of that opera was a singer who also lived here in Hampstead called Jennifer Vivian. Yeah. Um, I am sort of Jennifer Vivian's biographer. I did a lot of research on her a couple of years ago and made a, um, a website to her. Um, and this is one of the things that she did that I would dearly love to see revived in some way, shape or form. Um, we've, we've got people to remember Jennifer Vivian as a result of that, that website quite well. In fact, the lunchtime recital that happened at the Royal Opera House today was a Jennifer Vivian tribute concert. Mm -hmm. And it was a couple of sopranos who shared between them the Jennifer Vivian repertoire. Um, a lot of which was Benjamin Britten because he wrote things like The Governess in Turn of the Screw for her. Um, uh, she had uh, Titania in Midsummer Night's Dream was written for her. Lady Rich in Gloriana was written for her. Um, this is Julian in Owen Wingrave was written for her. All these things Britain wrote for Jennifer Vivian. Uh, anyway, one of them was that she had this role, this, the star role in The Sleeping Children, written for her by Brian Easdale. And Brian Easdale is at this point Benjamin Britten's landlord at 38 Upper Park Road. It was a very temporary um, residence in Belsize Park because he decided then that it was time to move back to Suffolk. He'd had enough of London. Britten really couldn't cope with metropolitan life. Um, it, it was part of that thing in his background that he, he needed to live in a small town where everybody knew him. He needed the comfort of, of people next door to borrow a cup of sugar from, you know, all that sort of thing. And he needed this com a community around him who would support him in what Auden called a warm nest of love. That's what he wanted, and he wasn't going to get that in London. So he goes back to Suffolk, and he, he bought a derelict mill on, a, on a, a small hillside, you don't get many hills in Suffolk, but there's a, there's a small hill that looks over Snape Maltings, very significant choice. Uh, and he converts that mill into a home, looks down on Snape Maltings, and then of course one day, years later, will turn Snape Maltings into a concert hall. Um, but while all that's being renovated, the, the, the old mill at Snape, he's still living in Belsize Park until he decides in March 1938 that he really wants to set up home with Peter Piers. And they move into a flat together in Earl's Court at Nevin Square. And from that point onwards, he only ever has a London pied-à-terre. You know, from then on, his main home is always in Suffolk. And the pied-à-terre move around a bit. In the 1940s, he's living in with his London pied -a -terre, it's 45A St John's Wood High Street. And during the 50s and 60s, he's living at 59 Marlborough Place in St John's Wood. And after that, he has various addresses in Islington. So he does always have a little London bolt hole, but that's all it ever is. It's just somewhere to stay the night when he's in London doing things for the BBC or whatever. Um, and of course, he... Although he cuts some runs from Hampstead after those two and a half years, he, he does come back to Hampstead an awful lot because he visits people here. A lot of the people who work with Britain are living in Hampstead. Kathleen Ferrier is living in Frognall Heights. Um, he carries on being in contact with Brian Easdale and Brian Easdale's wife. They move from Upper Park Road to Willow Road. Um, he's in contact with Hans Keller, and Hans Keller's wife, Milline. Um, at one point, they're living in Willow Road as well. And then they move to Frognall Gardens, where Milline Cosman still lives. And it's very interesting that Milline is one of the, some people here will know her, she's now very old um, and, and very blind and rather infirm. But at Milline's formidable age, she's one of the few of the surviving generation who had some intimacy with Britain. You know, almost everybody else is gone. I, it's something that people like me come up against all the time. I was, I've just been writing a piece about Britain and his relationship with Aubrey, but there are so few people left to go and talk to who were 
part of Britain's relationship with Alba now. They're nearly all dead, so there aren't many of the contemporaries left. Um, Britain himself died in 1976. Peter Pears died in 1986. W.H. Auden predeceased both of them. Um, and as I said, nearly everybody else has gone too now. The thing is, though, their addresses remain, sort of in a quietly evocative way. You know, you can go and stand in front of that front door at 559 Finchley Road, and however unprepossessing it is, you can think of all the people who pass through that door. Britain's mother coming out in a coffin. Um, and of course, what else survives is the works, is the music. Um, what I've been talking about here are Britain's early works. Um, but I hope that, if nothing else, this little talk will mean that during the next few weeks when you listen to Britain's music, and I can assure you that there will be no escape <laughs> from Britain's music in the next few weeks, because up until and thereafter, 22nd of November, it's going to be Britain, 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 as it should be. You know, if we cannot celebrate our greatest ever composer, what can we do? Um, and he's also, of course, if you check your change, there's a, there's a Britain 50 pence coin coming out. I, think, I don't know whether it's out already. It was supposed to have been coming out in the spring. But the, 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 the Royal Mint kept postponing and postponing it. But it should be out now. Mm -hmm. So there's a Britain coin, there's a Britain stamp. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's endless Britain on radio and TV and everything. But I hope that when you hear all this Britain music, you will think not only of Suffolk, but to some extent, think of Britain and Hampstead. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, I can see now that 559 Finchley Road will be on the map for next year's Hampstead Arts Festival. It's, it's, we time, have it had, there. it's time it had a plaque. It's it's a plaque. Yeah, we should get, get round to that. Uh, Michael said John's he would take some... Beg your pardon? There's one in St John's with Oh, there is, good. Michael said he'd take questions if you'd like to ask him. There'll be a glass of wine afterwards where you can chat informally. But anything you'd like to pitch at him now? Like, why didn't he go more often to the Hampstead Parish Church? <laughs> 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 it's just as well with him. <laughs> I think the vicar has a word. <laughs> I'm intrigued by the shadowiest figure in your talk, and that's his sister Beth. Mm, yes. You said, presumably, that he was living with her all the time. So, presumably, she was there in the flat when Peter Pierce had his week there, <laughs> as far as we know. Do, I mean, I my, don't know. My question <laughs> is Is the voice of Beth anywhere recorded? Does she say anything about him ever? Do we know anything about her views of her brother? Yeah, there, there are. I mean, all, all the. I think. I think. I think the BBC at one point caught the voices of all the Britain siblings. I mean, what, one of the charming things about the Britain siblings is that they all, they're all alliterative. <coughs> Britain's mother had a thing about alliteration, and the, the her you know her children are called. If, if, you, if you allow for the, 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 um, the, the contraction of the names, which they all were, um, they were called Beth Britton, Bobby Britton, Barbara Britton, and Benjamin Britton. They were, it, was, it was nothing but BBs. Um, I think their voices, their voices were all caught at some point by the BBC. I, I can't, though, personally recollect here anything that, of any significance that Beth said about, about living with Britain. But, what did she go on to do, Michael? She just carried on being a dressmaker. <coughs> um, Britain's brother Bobby was a schoolmaster. Um, and the significance of his schoolmastering was that he, he ran a prep school in Wales, Prestati. And it was for that school that Britain wrote a set of children's songs called Friday Afternoons. Um, and... Friday afternoons is going to be one of the very big things on November the 22nd. The, 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 the Aubra Music Organisation, which runs and rules the legacy of Britain and runs the Aubra Festival and all these things, has organised that on, I think it's early afternoon, or maybe it's lunchtime on November the 22nd, 100,000 schoolchildren around the UK are going to sing the Friday afternoon songs. Um, 
And what did Bar I can't remember what Barbara ended up <coughs> doing. But the, 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 only, the only surviving close Britain relative is his nephew. Um, and and he's, he, he went and worked for Shell, Shell Oil. And he's still floating around. You, know, you see him all the time at the Orga Festival, Britain's nephew. Yes, Harry. Michael, as you noted, um, homosexuality was illegal mm. in this country. But Britain and Piers were well known, if I'm not mistaken, to be a couple, yes. to be lovers. Were they ever at risk of... Yes. Um, Did everybody get that? Yeah. It, the, the, it, it's very interesting, the relationship between Britain and Piers. And that in one sense, everybody knew about it, and in another sense, they didn't. And, and it's interesting that when Britain died, the Queen sent a telegram of condolence to Peter Piers as the bereaved partner. And no such thing had ever happened before. And all the newspapers carried this. Queen sends message of condolence to Peter mm. Piers. It was that, you know, that was 1976. Um, it, it, it is very strange what the, 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 to some extent Britain was protected by the royal family without any shadow of a doubt um, Britain and Piers were part of that very close circle um, that was around the Queen Mother um, and almost certainly there were times when the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret stepped in and made sure they were okay there, there, there was certainly one point when things got very sticky for Britain. It was when he was writing Turn of the Screw. Um, and it was at the time when there was... I'm trying to remember the detail. There, there, was, there was a real Hangham and Flogham Attorney General. Manning and Buller, was it? Uh, Might have been him. No, I, that, that's not... No, there's Bullying Manor. No, that, no, that, no that's not... That's another name. one. I think there was somebody else. But, and, and he decided that there was going to be a purge, uh, a morality purge. We're talking about the very early 1950s here. Um, and, and he went on a purge of, of, of well-known homosexuals because he, he said in public, I don't see why these buggers should get away with it. <laughs> and he went after people like Cecil Beaton and Frederick Ashton and he went after Mo Lord Montague Bewley, and it was, of course, when Montague Bewley was arrested and sent to prison. And there was, there was, um, there was a cabinet minister who was arrested for homosexuality, and he too was sent... He, he wrote a book called A Fall Like Lucifer. And his name was Ian something, and I can't remember what he said anymore. But anyway, the, it, it, was, it was this huge homosexual witch hunt in the early 1950s. Britain was writing Turn of the Screw at the time, which he knew was a, a dodgy subject. You know, it, what is Turn of the Screw about? It's about, it's about a child who is, who, is, who is being possessed by a malevolent male spirit. Um, and you don't know what's quite going on there, because Henry James' his story doesn't make it clear what's going on. And the opera doesn't make it clear what's going on either. You're left to your own devices. So anyway, many people had said to Britain, steer clear of this subject. This is not a good thing to do. Do not write this opera. And Britain has started writing it. And normally he wrote very fast. But this took him an awfully long time to write. And in the middle of writing it, there was a, a knock on the door of the Red House, Albrook. And it was a man from Scotland Yard. Um, who turned up unannounced, and we don't know exactly what the conversation was, but apparently it was along the lines of, we know what you're up to, Mr Britton, and we've got your eye on you. We've got our eye on you. You watch your step, because we know what people like you are up to. Mm. And Britton was petrified. I mean, absolutely petrified. Um, and he stopped writing Turn of the Screw. Uh, and, and very nearly the whole project was abandoned. And then various other people said, you know, you've, you know, you've started doing this, you should carry on, do it, do it. So he did it. Um, but we very nearly lost that opera because of the man from Scotland Yard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
How are we doing? You all right to go on another ten minutes? People are absolutely exhausted. I'm not. <laughs> okay, that's so, over. Uh, Did any of the uh, chamber music come from the Hampstead years? Um, well, th th there's only chamber music from his time at the Royal College of Music. Yeah. But then, no, is the answer. I mean, he, he, th th he's writing chamber music as a student, and then he stops, and he really goes into writing vocal music. Yeah. Well, because he, before the first quartet, the first numbered quartet, there were some experimental yes, courses, yes. but that would date from the college days. That, the, yeah, that predates. I, I don't think there's really anything of, of any significance, yeah. chamber music, while he's in that immediate post-student period. Someone else? With it. Yes. Um, yeah, just going back to the relationship with Auden, um, I played Paul Bunyan quite recently, and uh -huh. it's got some brilliant music for, uh, for the orchestra, but the libretto is in some ways a bit of a flop, and I just wondered, um, could Britain perhaps have thought that his talent was potentially greater than Auden's, and would that have been some reason for not forming a relationship? Because, I mean, obviously, speaking yeah. of the greatest British composers, and I totally agree, um, do you think he realised at that point that he had so far to go? Well, of course, w w Bunyan comes a bit later than the Hampstead period. You know, yes. this is afterwards, and and I I think probably not. I mean, the the thing about Bunyan is that it was when it when it played in America, it was a failure, um, and this was a big blow for Britain. This was his first attempt at writing an opera of sorts, and and it flops. Um, and many people said to Britain, oh, Ben, it wasn't your music, it was Whiston's words. Um, and it's true. I, mean, I actually think, I think, Auden's words are fabulous for, for Paul Bunyan. But they're, they're fabulous as a long narrative poem, really. They're, they're incredibly complicated words for an opera. They're, they're, it, the, the texture is too dense, and the jokes are too erudite. Really, they were certainly too erudite for an American audience. <laughs> you know, and, and, and in a way, everything conspired against that piece. But I, I am pretty sure that after the failure of Paul Bunyan, it, it wasn't that Britain thought that he was a cleverer composer than, than Auden was a poet. I think it was simply that, that manifestly it had failed and Britain blamed Auden for its failure. That I, and I'm sure that that was one of the, the many nails in the coffin of the relationship. Um, but I also think that, the, that the, as many of you will know about Britain, he was somebody who wasn't really able to sustain long-term relationships with people. He, almost everybody who came into Britain's world, at some point was it thereafter rejected from it. And, you know, that's, Britain's... Britain's the psychotherapy of Britain is, is, is complicated and very interesting and wouldn't we really love to, to know what would have happened if Britain had, had had a therapist and poured his heart out. I don't think he did have a therapist and I, I don't think any of that ever happened. But, but, but Britain was a very, very complicated person. It's part of the reason why he's so fascinating. Um, but part of that process was that he, people were drawn to Britain and then if he used them... And then he withdrew from them. Mm -hmm. And 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 Auden was became one of Britain's as they became known corpses. His most famous corpse. <laughs> not, a, not only his famous, but it was the conductor. I did see Britain's children, the movie recently. Yeah. I found it very disturbing how he cut off with people suddenly. Especially when the bro voice broke from yes. the youngsters. I mean that was the very cruel thing. Was that, that was very cruel. Was, was that, you know Britain had these wonderful, jolly Larks in a very English public school way with these adolescent boys who, who in almost every case, they were thrilled to be with Britain. Britain was at his most human and his most kind and most wonderful as a human being, not with adults but with children. He was, by all accounts, he was fantastic with kids and they, they loved it. But, but eventually they were all dropped. And that was the really traumatic thing about these relationships. Actually, there's a very good play on Radio 3, I don't know if anybody caught it, a few months ago, about the relationship <coughs> between Britain and Imogen Holst writing Gloriana, and all the pettiness. I mean, she was an amazing woman. She put up with the treatment she got yes. and I mean, fought but, back. Of course, the sad thing about Imogen Holst was that she was desperately in love with Britain. Mm. You know, she was yeah. this, this prim, spinstery, schoolmarmish 
woman who, who was desperately in love with Britain. And you read her diaries, and it's all there. Her, her diary, she, she, she moved to Britain in, I think, 1952 to become his amanuensis, to, to be his musical assistant. And you read her diaries. She minutely um, writes down a great length Every single encounter she has in Albra High Street with Britain, you know, and it says in gushing terms things like, um, I, I, I went to the grocer's this morning, I ran into Ben, oh, it was so wonderful to see him again. She, she'd seen him the day before. <laughs> it, was, it was so wonderful to see him again. And, and I said to Ben, should I buy these lettuces? And Ben said, oh, no, they look a bit old to me. <laughs> and and uh, Ben is so wise, he always knows the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being a lovely audience. Thank you, Michael, for fantastically. I hope you're going to publish this. This was a world premiere. Nobody's ever heard this before. Really? Oh.